All right, everybody, thanks for being here. We're going to kick off our next talk with speaker Christian Paquin, and he'll be covering migrating to quantum safe crypto to protect against the quantum hacker. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm very happy to be back this year to discuss our progress uh, towards uh, migrating to post-quantum cryptography. Um, the work I, I'm presenting today is in collaboration with a lot of people, uh, some uh, uh, in my team at Microsoft Research, also with some other organizations. But uh, for this particular uh, work, uh, it's mainly been done with uh, Douglas Sibilla at University of Waterloo. So I don't know if you remember, or some of you might not have been born uh, 20 years ago when South Park introduced these very uh, weird characters, the little gnomes, and they went around and they had a plan to make money, a, a kind of a interesting business plan. They would go around, steal people's underpants, and then with some unknown way, they would try to make a profit. I'll get back to these guys later. But on an unrelated note, also something that happened 20 years ago is that I started to study quantum computing uh, in my graduate studies at the University of Montreal. Um, it was a fascinating subject and I kind of abandoned it. I came back to it a few years ago, this time not trying to use quantum computing, but trying to defend against it. Because I'm sure we've, you all know that was that not on before? Okay, so I, I'm sure you all know that quantum computers, although they would be fantastic for the field of algorithmics, you can solve a lot of problems more efficiently, for the world of cryptography, it's really bad news because um, a quantum computer would break due to Shor's algorithm. Uh, it would break RSA and DSA elliptic and uh, ECDH and all the elliptic curve variants essentially, because it can solve the underlying mathematical problems on which these uh, schemes are based. Namely, they, it can factor and find a discrete log of numbers very efficiently in polynomial time. What does that mean? It means that a quantum computer would break all the public key crypto we use today. And by that, what I mean is that it would break HTTPS, TLS, it would break SSH, would break peer-to-peer -peer communication uh, messaging systems like uh, Signal, break certificates, uh, software update channels, and Bitcoins. If you, somebody has a quantum computer, it could steal all the Bitcoins. Uh, there's another algorithm that's important in quantum computing. It's called um, the Groover's algorithm. It affects uh, ash functions and symmetric primitives like AES, but that's not a big problem. We can just double the, the key sizes, the ash sizes, and, and we're fine. So Shor is really the main problem here. And there, there's a wide spectrum of, um, of uh, estimates of when a quantum computer will be built. Some people say they will, it will never be built. Some people say it's going to be done in five years. But there's a wide consensus in, 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 in academia and experts that say a, a specialized quantum computer could be built within a decade or two to break um, RSA. So that means that we need to start thinking about migrating to quantum-safe cryptography. So quantum-safe cryptography or post-quantum crypto is not cryptography that runs on a quantum computer. It's a, it's a type of, of algorith uh, schemes, algorithmic schemes, cryptographic schemes that run on normal computers, but for which we know no way to break them with quantum computers. So I get asked often, like, why do we care now? Why don't you just tell me a year before the quantum computer is going to be built, and then we're going to scramble and rush to, to fix everything like we did for Y2K a year before? And that's a valid argument. The problem is that the data we encrypt today uh, on the web is at risk. It is at risk of being captured now, stored for a couple of years, and then decrypted. So if you're sending important data, trade secrets, or if you're a whistleblower and sending confidential information, then if this data can be decrypted in 10 years and ruin your life, then you need to 
start protecting it differently today. Another problem is that once we're ready to transition, it's going to take a long time to change the standards. The TLS, SSH, all these things will take years to update, and consequently also will, it will take some time to update the software stack, all the, the code. There's this notion of crypto agility to, uh, to program your, your software to be able to replace algorithms. We've done that many times, replacing MD5 with SHA-1, SHA-1 with SHA-256. So we're used to that, but there, you'll be surprised how many places RSA is just art coded in some code bases. So it might be hard to transition some software stacks. And also these new algorithms, they don't necessarily uh, function like the old ones. Some of them have huge keys, they run slower, so it might have a, a, a critical impact on some software. Bottom line, if you have data that needs to be secured in 10 years, take all these steps backwards, we kind of need to do that today. We're back to these guys now. So now they have a new idea how to make money. They don't need to collect underpants anymore. They can simply collect ciphertext, wait a few years, and then they can turn out a profit when they have access to a quantum computer. Fortunately, on the crypto side, uh, we're on top of things. So NIST, the National Institutes of Standard and Technologies, they started this, uh, this effort to uh, provide new standards to replace RSA and, the, and ECDH and all these, these things. They started in 2017. They, got, they, they, they asked the community to, uh, to, provide, to propose new schemes. There were 69 uh, accepted schemes that were submitted. Uh, and uh, in January of this year, they started round two. So Thanos happened, and a bunch of these just got uh, snapped away, and then some more got merged together because they were very similar. And now we're left in uh, right here with 26 schemes. And uh, we're two weeks away from a workshop organized by NIST where the submitters will discuss these run two candidates what updates they did in the second round. And if all goes well, then within three to five years, this is gonna publish some new standards. So it's coming up fairly, fairly soon. So our goal is to experiment with these new schemes and see what's the impact on our, the software we use today. So it was, this project was started by the University of Waterloo and we, we joined among with other many collaborators uh, to create a framework in which you can integrate your new crypto schemes, and in turn, we can take these and integrate them in higher level software. So the Open Quantum Safe project is an open source project. It's available at this uh, URL. Our goal is to integrate all the round two schemes. We're, we're on the way of doing that. And um, we also have integrations into OpenSSL, OpenSSH, and also OpenVPN, which allow you to try and deploy these things uh, experimenting with post-quantum cryptography. What's new, uh, what we did in the, the, this year, is we kind of completed the roadmap of all the use cases. So we can do full post-quantum and also the hybrid case, classical plus post-quantum, in both the key exchange and the authentication, the signature part, for both TLS 1.3 and SSH. We also have 1.2 support, I'll talk about it in a second, but it's not as complete. And we also implemented wrappers uh, so you can use the library from C++, C Sharp, or Python. So using uh, this uh, framework, we, we did some case studies and analysis of um, different ways you can plug in these algorithms uh, in our target protocols, SSH and TLS. So we just released a paper describing this. Um, it's gonna be presented at the NIST workshop in more details. Um, and we also have a, an extra collaborator on the, on the paper, Eric Crockett from Amazon, who, who provides also some insight from their S2N uh, SSL integ integration. And I will present a, a few results from, uh, from this analysis um, to give you an idea of, of what uh, is entailed when you try to migrate to post-quantum cryptography. So first, I mentioned this before, but we, we support what we call hybrid. Uh, deployments. So uh, hybrid means that, uh, so if you take a post-quantum algorithm, you don't want to transition to it right away. You don't want to dump RSA and start using a like picnic signature because these are fairly recent 
RSA has, has, uh, has, uh, has been there since 76. It's, it's been a lot of cryptanalysis done on it. So we don't know. These post-quantum algorithms may be broken in five years, not even by a quantum uh, computer, but maybe by a classical computer. Maybe there's a flaw in the algorithm that we haven't seen. So um, how to achieve um, more safety is to combine a classical algorithm with a post-quantum one. So you take, let's say, uh, ECDH and you combine it with a, with a psych algorithm and then you create a new one. And uh, the resulting communication will be secure if any of the two is secure. So if there are no quantum computers, then you're safe, you have your elliptic curve uh, defilement. And if there is a quantum computer, then your communication will still be secure because uh, you would have protected with a post-quantum one. So TLS, SSH, they already have this, this notion of negotiating an algorithm. The client sends its support list and the server responds and negotiate which algorithm they'll pick. But we don't have a way to pick two algorithms at the same time and combine them. So that's where we have to work. And there, there are multiple ways to do that that we, we list in the paper. Uh, the, the simplest one is just to create a new scheme. It's like you know P and J uh, sandwich, you know peanut butter and jelly, and just combine. It's the new thing. It's, it's P and J. So the same thing. We can take a classical algorithm, a post quantum one, combine them, and that's a new thing. The great thing is that this is backward compatible. So when you say I support these these algorithms, you just name the new one, which is a combination of both. And if the other peer supports it, you can have this secure uh, this this exchange that provides extra security. And there are a bunch of more advanced ways to negotiate the two algorithms separately. And um, they're a bit more complicated. They require protocol changes and, and might affect uh, a few items. And the things that you need to, keep, to take to care about when you design these is, OK, how is it going to affect backward compatibility, performance? Because for example, in TLS 1.3, when uh, the client sends uh, its first message to request communication, it has the ability to pre-compute some data. So assuming you're going to pick ECDH, here's a pre-computation for this exchange. But if I'm going to send three proposals and I have to compute pre-calculations for each, I'm consuming data, uh, the data is bigger. So we don't want to introduce too much, uh, much more uh, problems or, or more data, uh, increase the bandwidth requirements, uh, and we don't want to add communication messages and, and, uh, and affect the data flow too much. So these are all things that we take in considerations. The first thing we've implemented and the one that we, that we use for our experiments is, is the first one I mentioned, the combo scheme, because it is the simplest to implement minimal changes in OpenSSL and OpenSSH, and also uh, doesn't affect backward compatibility. So it, it's user all around. Um, so for the TLS uh, use cases that, that we consider, we have s did some work in TLS 1.2. The more recent work in TLS 1.3. Uh, the base protocol does not support, it only supports elliptic curve type exchanges, ECDH. Um, RSA is not even there anymore. So we have to masquerade our, our algorithms as, as uh, curves. So, so we pretend to be an elliptic curve, uh, curve and then um, we, we can run, so we don't have to modify the stack. And um, one, one problem is the size of these things. As I mentioned, some schemes have very large public keys or very large encryption systems or signatures, and this, the protocol specifies a maximum size, in this case, uh, two, six, 2 to the 16 uh, bytes for, uh, for public key and 2 to the 24 for certificates, for example. And some schemes uh, are bigger than that, so they wouldn't fit. But also OpenSSL has uh, smaller limits because RSA is not that big, that's the main thing that's used, so they don't want to provide this empty buffer where people could dust them, so they reduce this limit. So at some places we had to tweak, uh, remove uh, some of these limits in OpenSSL to be able to run our experiments. OpenSSH is uh, kind of similar, but uh, it has a bigger limit, it's 2 to the 32, so all the all the proposed round two schemes would fit there um, in theory. OpenSSH also has its internal limits that we had to tweak to, to fit our algorithms at some places. And um, in this case, we support both the client and server public key authentication. So it's kind of a full coverage of the, 
of what we want to, to achieve here. Uh, just as a summary of uh, what we tried, is a table that shows for the key encapsulation, so the key exchange. Um, so as I mentioned at the beginning of the OQS slide, there were some algorithms that are in there, some that are not, and there's no particular reason to why schemes are excluded other than the fact that people involved in the project contribute their own schemes and the other ones we're trying to, to fill them uh, by taking implementations that we can find uh, by the submitters. So at some point we hope to have all the NIST candidates in that table. Um, the, the little la yellow uh, check mark here, for example, Frodo as a, as a <clears throat> larger artifacts that we needed to, to tweak OpenSSL internal limits to be able to fit in there. Uh, NTLS, uh, sorry, NTS, which is a code-based scheme here, like a bit like McLeese, uh, also is a, a similar, um, is a similar scheme, which had very large uh, public keys, and we could not, uh, we're not able to fit them in, in the software that they, we, we had problem. And the spec in theory would support that size, but we were not able to make it work. So uh, it's a good reason to try these experiments in practice, because even in theory, you say the size should fit. Uh, there's some resulting, there's a lot of, of uh, code paths in the, in the software that did, didn't work. For the signatures, uh, we have a lot more of these yellow boxes, meaning that we needed to uh, augment the internal size in OpenSSL and OpenSSH to fit these large signatures or public keys. And um, we only had two failures, picnic level three and five were expected because the, uh, the signature size were bigger than what the, what's allowed by the, the protocol. Uh, the round two version of Picnic all fits, so they reduced, uh, they did some optimization that uh, allowed Picnic 2 to be used in, in TLS. And on, on the SSH side, we had some failures with the rainbow, uh, some more uh, higher level parameter sets. So now, uh, I'd like just to show you a quick demo of SSH. Um, so, if you know and use, if you know SSH, then that's going to look, it should look exactly as how you're used to see it. So, the only thing we did is add these post quantum algorithms, and um, nothing is different. If you've never seen an SSH connection, that's just going to look a little bit weird. Sorry for the, the unreadability of, that, of these consoles. But what I'm starting on the right hand side is a server. It's expecting a, uh, a ECDHT with a NIST curve P384 combined with a, a psych algorithm. There it is. And uh, on the left hand side, it's going to be a client requesting the same algorithm. And uh, I've put the debug output there, so it's to show that it, to show something on the screen. Otherwise, it would just be nothing. And uh, we see the connection was uh, successful. The exchange here, the authentication was done with the picnic uh, hybrid, the uh, picnic signature, and uh, also a ECDSA. So the point I'm trying to make here is that we modified these these these, these software stacks, but they work exactly as you did before. Uh, they did before. If you if you deployed SSH bef before, uh, one step that I skipped was the creation generation of the key pair and added it to the authorized set on the server side, so it works exactly the same. Which means that you can basically go out and, and try it and uh, deploy it even. So what's next? For us is uh, what well, well we want to add more of the round two schemes, the one we're missing. So we can have a, a, a full list of, uh, of all the algorithms. And we want to do some performance testing. We did some tests with the, a year ago with round one candidates, and it was very promising. The fast lattice schemes, for example, were competitive and sometimes even faster than state-of-the-art ECDH. And uh, some slower one, uh, which might not be suitable for you know, multiple connections a second like on an SSL server, could be great for kind of more one-on-one -on -one interactions either in a messaging system or SSH. So you really have a broad choice of deployment options uh, if you're a system integrator. And we also want to tackle more protocols. There, there's all sorts of things that needs to be uh, made quantum safe. We want to start looking uh, into that. And for you, an interesting thing to consider is 
are you working with projects or with software that, that protects data that needs to be secure for for a couple of years, for 10 years? And if so, you might want to be able to, you might want to start using uh, post-quantum cryptography to protect this data, either integrating in your code or using some of our forks and deploy them, SSH or VPN. All right, so that's my time. Thank you for your attention. I'll be posting the slides uh, right after the talk, and I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you. All right, thank you. <laughs> if you have questions, please come up to the human microphone. That is me. Come on down. Can you come up and... Thanks. Form an orderly line. My question was just, um, obviously I haven't looked at the GitHub repo yet, but did you use the OpenSSL module API to build your um, provider, or did you hack OpenSSL to extend it? Yeah, the, the, the engine API you're talking about? Yeah, engine. Yeah, okay. So no, we didn't. Uh, so the engine API is, a, in, in OpenSSL, there's a way to provide an alternate implementation uh, so if you have RSA and you implement RSA in hardware, you can create an engine to plug it in. So since these were new algorithms unknown to OpenSSL, we add to uh, to modify OpenSSL itself. And there's OpenSSL is in two layers, the crypto layer and then the SSL layer. The crypto layer, you could maybe get away with using the engine, but in the SSL layer, where you define specs uh, or specifications for the actual algorithms, that didn't work. So we modified the, the code directly. We have a fork. You can see the diff between the original project and, and the... Hey, um, I just have a question. I don't know, I mean, obviously you're aware that uh, IBM has actually created the Q1 system, correct? Because I was at CES in January and they, that's where they showcased it. And I don't know if you know anything about it, but knowing what it is, it's a legit... How do you think that's going to help your field of migrating regular, like what you were talking about, how do you think that the creation of the IBM 1Q system will help? Maybe not you, but like whenever they streamline it more, uh, how do you think the creation of the Q IBM Q1 system is going to help you and the people that come after you in this particular? Yeah. So, yeah, so there's a lot of vendors that, that have, uh, you know, work on quantum computing and provide specialized chips. A lot of what's out today, the D-Wave system and, and some others, they're very specialized and they're not general computers to do all not these yet. things. So the, the estimates I gave at the beginning, 10, 15 years, uh, it's the output of, of very serious uh, quantum computer experts that took everything in consideration, uh, research, time, uh, money invested, then they give a, like a 50% chance to, to have something in 10, 15 years, including all this development. That's all, that's, none of these is surprise work. You see the scaling of quantum computer, and we have to plan that pessimistically, if you're trying to defend against it, then our mark is like 10, 15 years. I mean, I just wanted to get your opinion on how you think, even though it might not be the Q1 system itself that helps you, like the later iterations of uh, quantum computing. Do you think that will just streamline the migration from regular to uh, PQC? Um, I mean, it's it's a uh, <clears throat> it's like all all this stuff. The migration doesn't use quantum computers at all. Right? We're just like if they they exist, they threaten what's in today, and you need to migrate to this stuff. So. What's going to trigger this is NIST is going to do their, they're going to have new standards and then the protocols will update. And what we're trying to kind of kickstart is you might want to migrate before all that takes place because that could be, you know, five, seven years and all the data that you encrypt today until then is at risk to be decrypted later. So if you want to migrate to something, a hybrid scheme, then that you have the tools to do that today. Expecting that one of these systems, D-Wave, IBM, Microsoft is working on them, Google, everybody has a quantum computing team, that somebody will have a functioning one in you know, 10, 15 years. Cool, thank you. Hi. Um, does any of the algorithm being evaluated bodes any potential application in an IoT environment where bandwidth, computational power, and latency are critical issues? Yes. So, so there's a lot of different flavors of algorithms. Uh, some are very big, very small, very slow, very fast. And some of them that might not be competitive in, in, um, 
and speed with some other like fast lattice one, they will they will give them advantages to themselves, saying that oh, we have very short keys, we fit in very small embedded systems. So this is the selling point to to some of these. And NIST said that they won't pick a winner; they they're, they're more likely to pick a, a bunch of them for different use cases, including uh, IoT, which is a very important uh, scenario. Well, that's all the time we have for questions, but hopefully he can be available afterwards outside. Yes, uh, I can stay here. All right, for one a more round of applause for our speaker. Thank you very much. <laughs>